Good day all and welcome to today's Lightbend webinar, ACA Revealed, a JVM architect's journey from resilient actors to scalable clusters. My name is Oliver White, Chief Storyteller at Lightbend, and I'm very happy that our expert speaker Hugh McKee is safely able to join us today. As a resident of Florida, you can imagine the trouble he's been dealing with lately. Luckily, he's safely in the Lightbend Atlanta office now. While I introduce today's topic, I'd like to ask our audience it's a quick poll question that's going to pop up on your screen. If you're not already using ACA, how likely are you to use ACA in production in the next six months? As a longtime ACA veteran, author, speaker, and developer advocate at Lightbend, Hugh is definitely one of the first people I'd think of to present this webinar today, which pretty much takes us from A to Z with ACA. So for those of you joining us today who have always wanted to learn more about ACA but haven't, had the, uh, haven't found the time yet, you're in luck. Because with over 12 OSS and commercial modules in the overall ACA toolkit, there's a lot to learn about ACA. So Hugh is gonna take us on a journey that leads us from individual actors and how they behave through supervision and self-healing, through reactive streams with ACA streams, ACA HTTP and Alpaca, then into the world of distributed persistence, event sourcing and CQRS, microservices, and finally distributed clusters and how to manage, monitor, and orchestrate them. Note, today's session is estimated to take the full hour. So if you do have to drop off, rest assured that we'll be emailing all registrants with the video and slides next week. Today's webinar is only made possible by our growing list of customers, including some of the most admired brands in the world, like our client Zalando, the largest largest European online retailer with over $3 billion in revenues. As you can imagine, they're looking for ACA and Scala engineers to join their teams in Berlin and Dublin. You can find out more about this opening as well as other openings with our clients under the company tab on lightben.com. If you have questions, feel free to add them to the GoToWebinar control panel and we'll see if we can get around to them in the Q&A part of today's session. If you already have a Lightbend subscription, you can always ping our engineering team directly through the customer portal with any additional technical questions you have. And finally, you can also email me directly at oliver at lightbend.com and I'll do my best to connect you with the right people. So let's get started. Hugh, thank you so much for <laughs> making the far more difficult than usual effort to join us today. We're all glad that you're safe and sound. Thanks, Oliver. I can tell you how glad I am to be here. Um, where there's some power and some internet access. So it's I really, really appreciate this. So yeah, so um, thanks everyone for joining. Really have been looking forward to this and I didn't want to miss it. So I, I tried to make the effort to, to get up here and do it. Um, as, as Oliver uh, mentioned, you know, we're going to take a kind of a tour through the ACA toolkit. And we're going to work up from actors to the system level. And in this slide here, you know, we're showing kind of the, the, the flow that we're going to take as we kind of go through this journey of uh, all the various different features within ACA. <clears throat> but before we get started, just want to give you a little bit of history. Uh, ACA first uh, came to life around 2009 when Jonas Benair started to uh, take the the, the ideas of an actor system that was initially developed back in the 70s by Carl Hewitt and brought it to the JVM in, in Java and in Scala. So ACA is available to us. If you're Java developers, ACA is there. If you're a Scala developer, of course, ACA is there. They're pretty much functionally equivalent. There's really no difference between using ACA with Java or Scala. It's just a matter of the syntax of the, of the languages. But the goal of ACA from the beginning is to bring a distributed, highly concurrent, and event-driven implementation of the actor model. The actor model is something that's really awesome, and I hope you get a sense of that if, you, if you're new to it here in this presentation. And Jonas is, and the ACA team's goal along since 2009 here, here when it first came out has been to, to bring this power to us as, as architects and designers and developers. So kind of starting at the atomic level or the molecular level of ACA, we're going to start, we're going to start our journey here by taking a look at uh, actors. And actors are really very interesting. It's a, it's a different way of programming uh, than what we're, many of us, I think, have grown up with. You know, with, we're, most of us are object-oriented programmers, maybe even functional programmers. But for the most part, we've been imperative programmers 
and you know synchronous and 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 doing things with lots of threads, things like that. The actor model brings in something that's really very very different. Um, an actor itself is pretty interesting. I mean, it's just a class you implement in Naka, you implement in Scala, it has methods that it, it, you're it, uh, extending a base class, and there's there's things like that. But the big difference between an actor and what we're normally used to as, as software developers is that the methods on an actor are not directly accessible from our code. You know, so you don't invoke methods on an actor directly which is really different. It takes a little bit of getting used to. And the reason for this is the only way to talk to an actor is to send it a message. And the message is actually sent through the actor, through the, uh, actor system that ACA provides. You don't, again, invoke any methods directly on the actor yourself from your own user code. That's very different. So what happens is messages are sent asynchronously, not synchronously, but asynchronously to actors. And these messages are first deposited into a, a mailbox, you know, kind of a queue of pending messages for the actor to process. So these messages are you know, added to this mailbox, and the actor works through these messages one at a time, message after message after message, processing all these all these different messages. The so that's kind of the basic mechanics of an actor. So the end result is that in a in a ACA system with, with a bunch of actors, the actors typically communicate with each other by sending each other messages. So in this little example here, we have actor A sending a message to actor B. Again, this is an asynchronous message. It's like you and I texting. You, you send me a text message, I get it. You're free to continue to go on. You're not sitting there in suspended animation waiting for a response from me like we would be, say, in a, a typical method invocation with a, you know, like an object learning program where the, the caller waits for a response. In this case, A sends a message and it's free to move on, do something else, or it can just stop you know, doing anything. Now B gets that message and maybe that triggers some kind of a state change. Perhaps this actor B represents maybe a, a bank account and the message came in and it was a deposit withdrawal and that, and that state change then is the balance of the, uh, that particular account is changed. Now, Actor B can send a message back to A saying, hey, I did what you asked me to do, but this isn't a requirement of ACA. This is more of a, 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 a way that we implement actors ourselves, us as developers. We, you and I would maybe design and implement an actor system is we think about the exchange of messages between actors, but it's very different when you're doing asynchronous messages versus doing, say, method calls. It's a different way of, of uh, programming. Part of that also is that, um, as we'll get later in the the, uh, the slide deck here, uh, actor A and B may be running uh, in a distributed environment. B could be on another machine and A is sending a message to B. So there's a possibility that B can't respond. So right from the very beginning, when you're thinking about messaging, you start to have to think about, well, what do I do when plan A doesn't work? You know, I want B to get my message and do whatever I ask it to do and then maybe send me a message back. but that might not happen. So as a contingency, you start to think about what do I do when I don't get that the, the desired response from B. And a, a simple pattern that's very common in ACA is to tell ACA, the actor system itself, hey, I would like you to schedule a message to be sent to me at some point in the future. And that could be you know, some milliseconds, it could be some seconds, it could be some minutes, whatever period of in the future you would like this message to be sent back so in this case what i'm showing here is that actor a is telling the actor system hey in a certain point in the future send me back this timeout message the plan here is then that actor a would send the message to actor b but say b can't respond b can't uh, you know it's down you know it, maybe it's uh, it's on another machine and that machine failed or something who knows but b's not responding so then what will happen is that A gets back this timeout message. This is, the, this is, not, uh, this is just a message. It's just, you know, so A is either getting back the response from B or it's getting back the timeout message. So the, the idea here is that you're kind of thinking about this from the very beginning. It's not like, it's a little different than exception handling where you, know, you, you get an exception, you kind of just throw it. In this case, you're designing actor A to be um, resilient pretty much from the beginning in a way that you're thinking about yeah, either I'm going to get a message back from B or I'm going to get a timeout message. And in either case, actor A knows what to do when either one of those two situations happen. 
So really, I think uh, failure is considered here to be an architectural feature, not an afterthought is, is the main point I'm trying to get across here. Another thing with actors is that actors can create other actors. So they form these hierarchies of actors. So in this example here, say we have actor A, which is considered to be a supervisor, is creating these worker actors. So there's this kind of parent-child or supervisor-worker relationship between A and the, the actors that it creates. And part of the, the uh, relationship between the supervisor and the worker is what's called a supervision strategy. And here what, what it is is that if one of these workers runs into a problem when it's processing a message and say that worker throws an exception, the typical scenario is that it's not the worker itself that handles the exception, it's the supervisor. And there's this supervision strategy that takes over. It's, it's well-defined, but it's customizable where you can uh, have a well-defined plan for what do you do in the case when uh, some kind of an exception occurs, some kind of problem occurs within a child or, or worker actor, the supervisor reacts to it. And the, the general response is that the supervisor can be set up to say resume the actor because the, the exception really wasn't that bad, or it could reset the actor by restarting it, or it could say this is really a pretty serious problem, I'm, I'm just going to stop this actor, this, this worker actor. The other option is that say A here looks at the exception and goes, oh, this is really bad. This is more than I can handle. I'm not set up to handle this kind of a problem. I'm going to escalate this problem up to my, my supervisor. So there's this whole uh, escalation uh, hierarchy here that, that uh, is, is available for pro, you know, kind of bubbling up problems depending on the severity of it. All this is under your control as, a, as the implementer and under your um, ability to design these things. But there's, it, the nice thing here is that there's this well-defined way for, for handling problems. So as a result, the typical actor system that people implement is some kind of a hierarchy. And initially, a lot of people, when they start first starting using actor, they make big actors. You know, they have actors that have lots of code in it. But over time, as you get more comfortable with the concepts, what, what, what happens is you tend to kind of divide and conquer. You, you have actors that delegate work off to other actors. And we'll get into that a, a little bit as well. But here, what I'm trying to show in this hierarchy is that you delegate the risky things off to the edge. Like here we have this tree and the leaf nodes here are, are red. And what I'm trying to signify here is that these are the guys that are doing risky things. Like maybe they're talking over the network to a database. That's risky, right? The network can go down, the database could go down, something could go wrong. Maybe you're talking to an external web service. Push that risky behavior off into worker actors so that the actors above it um, are in a way somewhat shield, shielded from these risky behaviors. Um, it's a very common pattern that it, you, you, people settle into where they have these hierarchies of actors and you're kind of delegating work, you, do, you know, kind of more fine-grained uh, specialization of actors, things like that, and you're pushing risky behavior off into the leaves of the, uh, of the tree. So in this case, we've got user A is A1, and B1 and C3, and, and C3 is, is pushing off, say, some risky behavior down into these D, D actors, in this case, D3. So <clears throat> another area that a lot of people use ACA for is for concurrency. It's a great way to handle uh, things that we would traditionally do with, with multiple threads. Here, there's a, a much uh, uh, more interesting way of doing uh, concurrency without getting into a lot of the technical challenges really of, of doing multi-threaded programming. I mean, you know, Java, for example, and Scala have some great things for threading, but it can get complicated and it, it's easy to get wrong. So here it, it's a little bit more intuitive in NACA to handle concurrency. And as a simple example, say uh, uh, we have actors A and B and we have this router actor R and the router actor R has created a bunch of workers. So A and B, they, they want some work done. So A sends a message to the router actor asking it to do something. The router actor doesn't actually do the work. It delegates that work off to some worker. So say in this case, it's the third worker. Well, that third worker is work, you know, performing that task, whatever that might be. Say B sends a message to the, to the router actor asking it to do some work. So the router actor forwards that message off to one of its other workers, and now you got things that are happening together. From the perspective of A and B, it, R is doing a lot of work and it's doing a lot of work at the same time. But in reality, R has 
uh, behind the scenes in, in a way delegated that work off to these actors. So A, uh, a and B get their work done, but we're doing some concurrency here, we're doing some multi-threading and it works and it's not getting really complicated. Um, another interesting part, and this comes back to the supervision, is that say A sends a message to the router, router sends, you know, forwards that message off to a worker, but the worker runs into a problem. In normal programming, not, you know, where we have the, the, the whole try-catch thing, uh, you know, the, the caught exceptions type of uh, programming, A would normally get the exception. With the actor system, remember, it's the supervisor that sees the exception. So A initially sent this message. She went to R, R sent it, forwarded off to the worker. The worker ran into a problem. It's the supervisor here, R, that, that sees the exception. So A doesn't get the response back that it's expecting. And this is where maybe uh, one possibility is you use that timeout mechanism. R could possibly have sent a response message back to A saying, hey, there's a problem and uh, you know, we can't, you can't, uh, I can't do what you asked me to do. Uh, but the, the idea here is that A is not seeing the exception. The caller is not having to deal with not only the, the thing that it wanted to get done didn't happen, but also having to deal with some kind of an ex exception but that maybe isn't the best place for the exception to be handled by a or you know by the clients of the service in this case. So that was really quick, kind of looking at, again at the molecular level of ACA at the actor's uh, level. But um, there's a lot of power there. There's concurrency. There's resiliency. There's there's things that you can do. It it, it is different, but when you really wrap your head around it, it's a really really fun way to build systems. And it, it is different, but it's I think it's it's a really fun way to build systems when you're kind of building systems thinking in actors. So moving on, kind of up the stack here, we're gonna take a quick look at uh, streams because it, this is a big feature of ACA that came out a few years ago and it's a, it's a very popular feature. So first, reactive streams. Um, if many many of you may be aware that Java 9 is coming, I don't know if it came out or, or it's, I know it's soon to come out. I think it was, I, last time I heard it was around September now, um, but, um, any case, the reactive streams has been a standard that was defined a few years ago. Lightbend was type safe at the, at the time was uh, very actively involved in that. Other companies like Netflix and so on were also heavily involved in it as well. But there was a standard that came up with what's called reactive streams. And the big feature of reactive streams is you've got this processing of, of a stream of data with back pressure, meaning that it's kind of like this this flow of traffic that the the traffic ahead of you is signaling when you need to slow down you can't go any faster because downstream can't handle uh, any more flow and that's exactly the way reactive streams works is that the producer of upstream data cannot overwhelm the the, the downstream consumers of the data so with java 9 the uh, reactive streams is is a feature of java 9 and there's four new classes. I'm showing three of them here. There's or interfaces. I'm sorry. There's a publisher. There's a subscriber, and there's a processor. And these guys are um, the the main components of of a stream. Now, in Java, these uh, interfaces, you know, the implementation is not really intended to be used directly. It, it's it's kind of the intended to be the foundational piece for streams. And Aka Streams is an example of this. Aka Streams is is built on top of the reactive stream standard, but it adds a ton of functionality beyond that. So the terminology is a little bit different in Aka Streams. We have sources and syncs and flows versus with um, Java, there was a publisher, subscriber, and processor. Same functionality, they, they're doing basically the same thing. It's just a little bit different terminology. The, the idea also is that with reactive streams is that different implementations, like there's a RX implementation of reactive streams, there's ACA streams, for example, they can play with each other. They, you know, um, because they're, they're following the same standard. The, again, the big difference though with ACA streams is that they put a, the ACA team put a ton of work into adding a, a lot of functionality, particularly in the flow area. And there's things like, um, this would be familiar to any functional programmer, you know, things like filter and fold and map. These are all methods that are provided with the flow that uh, you can use for transforming data as it flows through the stream. And uh, also there's quite a bit in the, uh, in ACA streams for 
building some pretty interesting streams. Like I pulled this right from the ACA documentation. Up the top here, there's a diagram of this graph. It's kind of non-trivial. The graph has you know, fan outs, fan ins. It's got a feedback loop, pretty cool stuff. And then down below, here's a Scala example of the implementation of that graph. So the code is pretty tight. I'm not going to go into the details of the code here, but I just wanted to kind of show you that's a pretty interesting flow with not a lot of code. And here's a job, the Java for that same that same graph. You know, you know again, pretty interesting uh, flow graph here, but not a lot of code to do it. A lot of power in, in the API that's provided by Aka Streams. Building on top of Aka Streams is Aka HTTP, which is kind of a natural fit because when you think about it, an HTTP request, which what we're doing is we're transforming an HTTP, HTTP request into an HTTP response. So the flow is that transformation that, uh, that occurs. So streaming is uh, kind of a natural for that. And Aka Streams, uh, uh, Aka HTTP also uh, works with a WebSocket. Same thing, it's kind of natural that it's handling the the exchange of messages you know that goes through websocket and providing that that flow processing of those messages you know they coming in or going out or, or both through um, aka streams using aka http continuing on with that there's uh, this uh, project called alpaca which is bringing uh, kind of an aka streams alternative to apache camel so the big thing here is that the community the open source community uh, they're building out all these different connectors, just like with Camel has a huge set of connectors. What they're doing with Alpaca is adding in a huge set of connectors for streaming. So you can see all the connectors. Um, I think these are the, the majority of the connectors that, that I've listed on the side here, things like a bunch of different AWS connectors, Cassandra, um, JMS, you know, things like that, that uh, you know, hooking in Aka stream processing with Camel-like connectors. Uh, Alpaca, again, is a very interesting uh, project that's, that, that is trying to solve this similar problems as Apache Camel. Here's a little bit of uh, Java code uh, to show some of the processing. And again, I just grabbed this code right out of the uh, Alpaca documentation. But what's pretty interesting here is you know, you're taking, say, a source of Wikipedia data, a source of images. You're, I like the, the way they use the in term of the enrich the data. And then the enriched data is being pushed out to a couple connectors. One is going out to an AWS S3, and another one's going out to a Kafka topic. So a lot of power here and some fairly concise code. And again, Aka Streams is very powerful. Um, you're not dealing with actors directly here. The actors are, are being used under the covers. What you're doing here with, with Streams is you're more in kind of a functional type of programming where, where you're dealing with flows of, of things. And in general, uh, you know, the data is passing through various different uh, functions to, to perform different transformation operations. So the big thing with React with Aka Streams is its reactive streams, and it, the, it provides that back pressure, and it provides some really rich set of um, controls or you know or uh, code for transforming data. And, and again, uh, people are doing lots of really interesting things with, with streaming these days. This is my favorite area, my, my personal favorite area the, in, in the clusters. And the reason for this is that um, I've been a Java developer for a long time. And all of a sudden, going to Akka, you're in this universe where you're no longer constrained to a single JVM. You can build a system that behaves as a single system that's running in a distributed environment with multiple JVMs. That just blew my mind when I first started um, using Akka. I, and I think it's one of the most interesting and powerful features of it. Starting kind of at the, the cluster level, so what an Akka cluster is, again, is just a, a, it's a collection of JVMs that are running together as a single cluster. They, they're aware of each other. They, they, they know of each other that, you know, all the members of the cluster, for example, they, they're, they're self-aware of each other. They're monitoring each other. They're keeping an eye on each other. And there's things like the cluster is, knows when, say, when we lose a node. You know, it, there's a, a well-defined way for ACA to handle those kinds of situations. Just like if you have a cluster where you, you gain a node, you're, you're, you're either decreasing capacity because you want to or you don't want to because something broke and the system can keep running and, and deal with that, or you're inc increasing capacity 
because you need more capacity. But the system keeps running while all this is happening. To me, that's just uh, very different than, than things I've dealt with in the past. The management of all these nodes within the cluster is actually being handled by um, Akka itself. The us as developers and architects, we're participants in this, but our our use of this is really focused on how our actors react to, say, changes in the topology of the of the the cluster, and the cluster itself is managing the the monitoring and the comings and goings of nodes within the cluster, uh, things like that. So. What I wanted to show here is some of the, the really interesting uh, patterns of actor communities in a way that are have been set up uh, out of the box that come with Akka. But I also want to have you kind of come away, I hope, with a sense of this. these are things that you can do as well on your own. Come up with your own ideas for building these communities of actors to do some really interesting things. So the first one is cluster sharding. And the idea with cluster sharding is that Say you have a, a, a collection of actors, a large collection of actors. They, all these actors are, are kind of the, the same type of actor, but they're for different things. So for example, maybe each one of these actors is um, connected to, in a way, it's the, the state of a device in, in some kind of Internet of Things application. Or it could be maybe each one of these actors represents the, the state of an entity, uh, you know, some data. And these, you know, the, the, these entities are the ones that are currently uh, being used, you know, that say you have a large database of entities and a subset of those, those entities are currently in use. So you want them in memory, you want the state to be in memory, but they don't fit on one machine. So this little rectangular box here in the middle represents a single node. It's too small for this large collection of actors to fit on. Just as likely, it might be that you don't want to put all these actors on a single machine. You'd rather have you, your application be running across multiple machines so that way you have a level of resilience and elasticity so that if say if you lose a node the there are other nodes that can take up the slack while the system is running and there's maybe a momentary um, burp while the, the, the reacting to say the, the loss of a node and the actors around that node are recovering but the system as a whole keeps running and, and it's not a complete uh, failure of the whole application so in cluster sharding the idea is that you take this large collection of actors and you break them up into shards, logical shards. And maybe there's some kind of like device identifier or any identifier and you take a hash code of that and you do a module divide and that comes up with the, you know, the shard ID for each one of the entities. And so you have some kind of sharding strategy for these actors. This is all well-defined in, in cluster sharding and the ACA documentation. So then what cluster sharding does is it takes that logical collection shown here at the top of the diagram and distributes those shards across a cluster. So I'll say this in this example, we have a cluster of four nodes. Cluster sharding is handling what, where is each shard distributed across the, the cluster. And it handles the routing of messages to each one of the individual actors, these little blue dots in, in each shard. Each one of those blue dots represents an, an actor, like a, uh, an actor for an IoT device or an actor for uh, particular uh, entity, you know, uh, like a bank account, for example. Where it really starts to get interesting is where, you know, these shards that are distributed across the, the cluster, say we lose a shard, the shard goes, I'm, I'm sorry, a node goes down, we, we lose a node. The node goes down, cluster sharding sees that that node goes down, it knows that those shards, what shards were, were on that node that went down, and it helps in the resurrection of the actors that were taken out by the loss of this node by redistributing those actors to other nodes in the cluster. Now, our responsibility, you and I as developers, what we're responsible for is the recovery of the state of these actors. So if, if you know, say these actors were uh, bank accounts, these actors are gonna be recreated on other nodes in the cluster and somehow the state, like what's the current balance of this account has to be recovered. And we'll look at that in a little bit with uh, Acker Persistence, but you have to have some kind of a strategy to recover the state. That, that's our responsibility. But what cluster sharding is doing for us is it's helping with the management of all these shards and the distribution. We're not having to deal with that. Uh, we're just having to deal with focusing on the individual actors here in the shards. Again, these little uh, blue dots. Very, very powerful. 
So in this case, where say we lose a node, that shard happens to be moved to one of the, the, the active nodes that are there uh, in the cluster. So with, with cluster sharding, it's really pretty interesting. There's these other actors that are, that are involved here that, that do the, the work for us. The, the important ones, I'll start with, in the bottom left, there's this shard coordinator actor, the little circles, the, you know, the actor, the, the little uh, shard coordinator actor. There's one of those for the cluster, it's a cluster singleton. On the top left of each node in the cluster, there's a shard region actor. And there's one of those per node. So it's kind of like a node singleton act type of an actor. So the way a cluster sharding works, if, if you want to send a message to a particular actor somewhere in that logic collection, you send a message, you don't, we don't know where that actor is at. So say uh, on node two here, um, uh, it has an endpoint, uh, an HTTP endpoint. Each one of these nodes has, a, um, has HTTP endpoints. A request comes in, there's a load balancer in front of this whole thing, it ran, you know, the round robins messages across the cluster, and a message comes in for entity one, two, three, and it just happens to fall on node two. So shard region uh, two gets it and it goes, oh, I don't know where this guy's at, where is he in the cluster? So it, it sends a message to the cluster sing singleton shard coordinator, and the message is basically asking, where is entity one, two, three, uh, supposed to be uh, distributed across all the shards in the cluster and say the shard coordinator sends a message back this is kind of an example of actors sending you know sending requests getting responses things like that and say that in this particular example uh, the shard coordinator says oh it's in region three so what the shard region on node two does is it forwards that hey here's a message for entity one two three off to shard region three now, shard region three is going to have to go through the same cycle. It's going to have to ask because it doesn't know either. Hey, where is entity one two three at? It's going to send a message to the shard coordinator. The shard coordinator sends back and says it's in region three. Oh, that's me. So now it knows that that entity belongs on uh, its its node. And there's another actor that comes into play here, that, which is the shard, and the shard actually ends up creating um, the actor itself. Now. You look at this and go, wow, there's all these actors involved, there's all these messages involved, but a couple of things. One is that we're just, in our code, you and I, when we're developing this, we're just sending a message to a shard region. Boom, that's it, we're done. Cluster, uh, cluster sharding handles the rest of this. The other thing is there's intelligence built into this thing, like the shard regions remember where shards are at. So it doesn't have to ask a sh the shard coordinator every time uh, where a particular shard is at, because once it's it's told where a shard's at, all the all the shard regions remember that. So there's some optimizations going on here. But again, this is all happening kind of behind the scenes for us, it's, and it's it's happening within these other actors. the The other point I want to make, though, is that this is just an example. Look at this. We have, you know, three what uh, four different actors here, really, that are. Uh, kind of managing the, the whole sharding. We've got the, the shard coordinator, we've got the shard region, we have the shard, and we have the actors themselves. And the power of, of what's going on here with just these four different kind of specialized actors, you know, the, the cluster singleton, the, the, the node singleton, and then the shards themselves, kind of a dividing and conquer, conquering and doing something really pretty elaborate, with, but without a, a lot of, a huge amount of complexity. These are things that you can do also on your own, you know, kind of with your own design, coming up with uh, interesting patterns of ways to use your own actors. So moving on, build, kind of building on top of cluster sharding is uh, event sourcing and, and CQS, or Command Query Responsibility Segregation. This is a, another feature that's provided with ACA, and it, event sourcing and CQS is, is um, getting, kind of gaining in popularity. It's been around for a while, but it's, it's gaining in popularity with microservices, and it's a different way of doing persistence. So here we're basically building on the cluster sharding example. The, uh, the only difference is that the, uh, with ACA persistence, we're, we're building in the persisting of the state of an actor. Remember I mentioned before that if, say, uh, uh, we lose a node and, and the actors have to be recreated, we have to recover the state? Well, you have to have some kind of persistence store to recover the state. Well, this is uh, an implementation of where this is actually done for you, 
but it's using the pattern of event sourcing to do that you know, with an event log. So the idea is that a command comes in, it gets routed to the entity for that, uh, you know, by the entity ID through cluster sharding. And then when the message arrives at that actor, the actor is implementing a uh, Acker persistence. And in the Acker persistence pattern, there's a persist step. And in this case, we're actually persisting the event that, uh, you know, and say for example, this is a, a again, a bank account. And the, the command that came in was, here's a deposit. If that command is accepted, yeah, it's a deposit for this account, uh, we're gonna do it. So the command is kind of a, a request to do something in the future. An event is saying, yeah, th it happened. So the, we're, what we're storing is the fact that it was done. We've accepted the deposit, we've accepted withdrawal, it's persisted. And then once the, the event is persisted in the event log, the entity itself updates its state. It you know, does the state chain, you know, either increments or decrements the balance safe in the example of a, of a bank account. There's another feature here that's called Aqua Persistence Query, where this is the command uh, query responsibility segregation, the query part. You know, there's, it's also called the right side and the read side. The right side is the event log, the read side is where data is stored in a, in a more queryable uh, way, whereas an event log isn't very queryable. So in any case, um, there's some interesting dynamics that are going on here. And the reason why I called out that the, uh, what's happening here is that the events are being propagated from the event log into the read side. This is non-transactional. This isn't a single database transaction. So there has to be some things done to guarantee that you don't miss events. I, we don't have time to really get into the details, but what I can tell you is that doing this without losing events is built into Aqua Persistence Query. It's, it's, it's an interesting pattern that if, you're, if this is something that you wanna do, you should really look at, at how this is done because uh, it's, a, it's a, a kind of a subtle point and it's very important, but it is built in where the, we're not pushing events from the event log to the read side, it's actually the read side is pulling events from the event log. It's a much uh, less brittle way of doing it. We're not gonna lose events using this approach. So kind of moving along with these communities of actors, there's another uh, feature in ACA called publish and subscribe. Again, these are all part, you know, in parts in the documentation. You can easily find them in the ACA documentation, which is very extensive. But in this case, we've got a, a, some other interesting actors. We've got a media, mediator actors, a mediator actor per node in the cluster. We've got a you know n, n number of subscriber actors, actors that are uh, have registered some interest in some kind of an event, <clears throat> and then we have publishers. So, say a publisher wants to publish an event, you know, some you know, publish, you know, send a message. So the publisher simply sends a message to its local media. Media. What I mean by that is that the mediator that happens to be uh, these are all actors uh, happens to be on the same node in the cluster. So in this little diagram. Uh, the third node, the publisher actor is there, it sends a, a message to the mediator actor on its local node, the publisher actor is done. He's, he, he's, he's kind of fire and forget. The mediator actors though, they're cluster aware actors. They, these mediator actors know that there's a cluster here. They know that they've got counterparts on other nodes within the cluster. So the mediator actor that first gets a message fires off that message off to its teammates across the cluster and says, hey, Here's uh, an event that, a, that this guy published and you need to, to deal with that. In turn, each of those media directors then sends that message on to whatever subscribers are up there. Um, this isn't all happening in lockstep, but it's happening as a series of kind of, kind of cascading series of messages that are, that, are, that are happening across the cluster. Again, this is happening with the actors that are provided by publish subscribe for us using this, we just send a message off to the local mediator and we're done and, and, uh, and, and this works. And finally, um, distributed data. The um, distributed data is, bait, is where there's data that's replicated across the cluster, but the, the data itself, the kinds of data that we can use for this is, is somewhat restrictive. It, it's using this conf conflict-free replicated data types. Things like uh, counters are really good examples with this, you, where you can have a kind of a distributed counter that um, where it, you know, you're just adding or subtracting from the counter or 
sets are another good thing for uh, CRDT types of data. So there, there are some restrictions on the kind of kinds of data that you can use with distributed data, but it's it, it does provide some interesting capabilities. Again, we have uh, a set of actors that are distributed across the cluster. In this case, we've got replicators, uh, one on each node, and we have replicated uh, distributed data actors across the cluster. So in the example here I'm showing, like for key value one, key value two, key value three, there's an actor for each one of those key values uh, replicated across the cluster. And then there's an updater actor here as, a, as an example. So say this updater actor wants to know the value of key three. So it sends a message to the replicator. That's all the updater does. It doesn't know anything about anything else in, in this environment. It just knows it's going to talk to its local replicator actor. The replicator retrieves the value from key three and sends a message back to the updater. Then the, up, you know, the updater says, all right, I want to change that value. I want to add one to the counter, for example. Um, so now we have the, the whole situation where this, this change has to be replicated across the cluster for all instances of key, key three. So the replicator is, again, it's a cluster where actor. It knows that it has teammates on other nodes in the cluster. It forwards that update message off to those other actors, those other replicators. And then those up, each one of those replicators then is responsible for changing its local copy of key three. Again, from the perspective of, uh, from our perspective as developers, we're just sending a message to the local replicator and the magic, you know, the miracle occurs in a sense. Um, but these other actors are doing it. Also again, though, I wanted to hopefully show you these, some of these interesting actor patterns and get you thinking about uh, things that you could do, things that you could invent, invent that are uh, like this, that do some really cool, pretty interesting things, way beyond some of the stuff I think that we've done in the past with other tools that we've used. So that was kind of a really quick tour of um, the the cluster features. Um, now I want to get into clustering just real quick, take a look at um, some of the things that we, we can do here. Um, and again, this, the strength is in numbers, you know, that if you're running a, a system that's distributed on multiple nodes, you have that ability to um, take a hit and keep running all, and also you have the ability to increase your capacity when you need more capacity. So that's all about being reactive. ACA is reactive. ACA I think is the inspiration for what reactive is, you know, response, resilient, elastic, message driven. That's ACA. Um, so with, with, in terms of, of building things, uh, people use ACA with things like ACA HTTP for, you know, RESTful, end, uh, RESTful endpoints. Or people use ACA with Play and ACA HTTP to build web-like clients. A new one that came out last year is a Lagom, which is a framework for building microservices. And with a, a, a very opinionated way of doing microservices um, with a strong bias towards using event sourcing and CQS, for example, based on ACA persistence, ACA uh, persistent query and, and cluster sharding, which we just looked at a few minutes ago. The point I want to make, though, here is that um, because we're using ACA, we're, we have the ability to not only run on a single node in a single JVM instance, but we can run on multiple JVM instances. So in effect, you're building services or microservices, which all the rage these days, um, that are clusters in themselves. And these microservices are, are then, you know, they can be stateful, you know, the non-trivial services that, have, that maybe have state that they want to maintain and not you know, relatively simple stateless services, which are great when you can do it, but when you have to have state, ACA is a really good solution for that and distributed. You know, so things like we're running on a cluster. So using ACA and HTTP or an ACA and um, play or, or um, log on, um, you're getting this capability because of the fundamental capability that's provided with, with ACA itself. So there's a lot of capability that um, you, you're getting to build real services um, using ACA, you know, with things like with Play and Logum and, and ACA HTTP. So finally, we're getting up to the top level here in the uh, the systems level, and um, I think as we're all aware, that things are getting really interesting these days in terms of how we build systems. You know, we've we're moving um, from 
building uh, monoliths, which we've been doing for a long time, and most of us know how to do that really well, and monoliths are, are, have served us well for a long time. But now we're starting to, to do things like, um, we, we use the term microliths a lot. And microliths is kind of like a microservice, but not quite. And the difference is that there's some level of, um, you know, the whole point of a microservice is there's loose coupling. The, the least amount of coupling is possible between services. A microlith is kind of like a microservice, but not quite. There's some level of coupling, and typically where, it, where this happens is that the, all these so-called microservices are using the same database. I'm not saying this is bad. This is kind of an evolutionary step. It's just a fact of life. This is how people build systems. And of course, microservices, uh, where you do have as the least amount of coupling as possible, typically only at the API level, you know, between microservices, that they don't share databases, they are independently deployable, um, things like that, you know, the microservices. And then the new one that's really kind of exciting, uh, things are happening in the space is, you know, Amazon introduced lambdas, uh, you know, and now we're talking about, you know, um, serverless functions, for example. Um, the point I want to make here is that Akka helps with all these things, even down to the um, serverless functions where, say, you want that function to perform very, very quickly, so you want to do some level of threading in there. And maybe it, it would be great to do some concurrency. Well, Akka is great for concurrency. And so it, it, I think it has, that might be one good fit for, for even in uh, kind of the, 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 uh, the kind of specialized functional, the serverless function area. But certainly in microservices and certainly in monolith and certainly in microliths, Akka has been used a lot to build some really interesting systems. The reason for this is that we're, we're trying to move, I think, a lot of us to architectures and implementations of our systems where we can take a hit, you know, something breaks and the system as a whole doesn't go down. You know, it's like these days, every time some system goes down, this in the public eye, like an airline system goes down or even Amazon, you know, Amazon had an outage on the East Coast of some not too long ago. I think it was S3 that went down and, and everybody felt a hit. Um, and it makes big news. You don't want to be, we want to try and not be in the news when our systems go down. So we're trying to come up with architectures to, to do that. So that's why we're starting to build systems like microservice systems or distributed systems where we're, we're not kind of putting all our, our eggs in a single machine, you know, in a single model if we're, we're breaking these things apart. With Akka, we're taking it to the next level as well in that individual services as I, was, I showed you a few slides back, are built um, so that they can take a hit, but the service itself keeps running. And the service also, of course, can grow and it can expand in capacity uh, as needed if, it, you know, say, as the load goes up. You know, Akka gives you the, 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 the power to do those kinds of things. Just really, really quickly, there's, everything I've talked about so far is all, the, all open source. You know, just right out, you know, right there in, in Akka, the Akka documentation. But we've added a number of things for uh, our customers. And so one of them is called the, sp the split ring resolver. I'm not going to go in a lot of detail. I'll just, just save some time. But the, the sp split ring resolver handles a situation where you're, you're, you're effectively your brain is split. You've got a bunch of machines running in the network. And the network breaks somewhere. And it kind of it, it cuts off some machines from other machines. So in effect, just like a, this a diagram here I'm showing is that the two sides of the brain can't talk to each other, but the, but the both sides is up. And with Akka, in, because we're maintaining state in a lot of situations, that's not an acceptable types of situation. So sp the split brain resolver resolves that. It, it effectively identifies a winning side of the, of the partition and a losing side. And it shuts down the losing side and the winning side takes over. In addition, there's a number of other things that are added. The biggest one probably is monitoring. And from, from Akka, there's the monitoring there that's provided is that we have all kinds of events and metrics that are being captured that uh, you can either view through some kind of uh, fancy pane of glass, uh, your, your favorite tool. We provide a, a very cool uh, monitoring tool ourselves called Op Clarity. And, but these events and um, Metrics can be fit into logs and, and all kinds of different ways, but 
the main thing here is that there's a lots of detail that can be captured that you know things that are happening inside of a, an ACA system inside of a distributed ACA system that, that can be monitored and, and uh, analyzed. Other tools like there's a configuration checker, ACA has a con configuration file and this checker will kind of look for common problems in configuration files. And for support, there's kind of a, this diagnostic recorder that kind of packages everything up to send off to support people. So that if you're having a problem, we can, you can kind of feed a whole package to, to us and we, we can take a look at it. So the uh, kind of wrapping up, we're moving into this new realm, I think, in that we've got on the left, get some really interesting systems that are producing data. And on the right, the, the other thing that's happening, of course, is the, the whole analytics thing, you know, machine learning, AI, all that stuff. It, you know, people seem to be going nuts there with that. Um, but I think the realization is that data is the new gold, right? And applications produce data, but applications also want to consume that data. So we've got data that's flowing out of applications into you know, cognitive analytics, as, as I've kind of labeled it here. And then a lot of that data is going fed, being fed back into the application, kind of you know, make those applications better, smarter, you know, more compelling to, to their users. And with Akka, we're helping you, know, to you to kind of build these systems and really be reactive, you know, really do what we're saying in, in reactive. You know, these systems are responsive, no matter what the load is, they're resilient to taking hits, to you know, network outages or nodes going down, things like that. They're elastic, you know, where they can expand, you know, or contract you know, to save you money when you, you know, the load goes down, the traffic goes down. And a fundamental cornerstone in Aka is that they're 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 message driven. So, Aka really is a toolkit for for building those highly concurrent, distributed, and real, resilient message driven applications in Java or in Scala. And uh, and I thank you. That's the the whole journey. Uh, we made it in about. 50 minutes or so here. Um, there's quite a few customers. I just just want to say, if you're interested in learning more, that we have a lot of case studies. I think it's around 70 or so of people that have done some really, really interesting things with Akka. And it's all over the map what people are doing with Akka. It's really uh, fun, cool stuff. And some really important things like um, eBay. For, or, I, one of them, I forget which one, it, it popped out of my head. But things like uh, an eight node cluster that handles a billion transactions a day. I think it was eBay. Anyways. That would uh, that would actually be PayPal. PayPal, um, thank you. Yeah, thank you. they they on our on Lightben.com. Uh, to our listeners, you can actually go to our case studies or our customers tab and uh, see all of our customers and some of the case studies associated with them. And that's a and in fact, PayPal was a guest webinar uh, presenter. Uh, with us uh, in the last nine months, so you can actually see what they have to say in their own words. Thanks, Oliver. Yeah, I, I always get those two mixed up. <laughs> well, uh, PayPal so was, it was owned by uh, eBay for some time, I believe. So I won't use that as an excuse, though. It's just my future. <laughs> so it, um, one final thing, um, and I'll turn it over to you, uh, Oliver. Is, um, if you're interested, um, I was lucky enough to be able to publish a uh, um, uh, O'Reilly guide on building reactive systems using actors. It's kind of a general introduction to actors. It's no code or anything like that, but it's kind of conceptual things. Like, again, like when we we're going through the section on communities of actors, it was trying to help introduce, you know, what's it like to build actors, what do actors do, how do communities of actors work, things like that. It's a quick read, but um, hopefully if you're interested, it might be useful. Yeah, and I, for one, uh, was uh, very happy to uh, be able to work with Hugh when he was creating this book, and it was an excellent learning experience for me, which is one of the best parts of my job, I suppose. So uh, we do have a lot of questions, um, <laughs> actually more questions than I'm typically used to seeing in our webinars. So I've tried to consolidate some of the duplicates. Uh, let's start uh, with, let's say, real-life clustering in a what, what uh, our questioner is referring to as a super dynamic container managed environment. Um, so we're thinking about Kubernetes, we're thinking about uh, Mesosphere uh, or Apache Mesos and Mesosphere DCOS. So uh, how does Akka clustering make this sort of deployment environment especially nice? 
Yeah, that's a good question. That's a, um, probably a big question, I know. Yeah, well, but I think some interesting, I heard um, DACA, or Docker being, I heard a nice definition of it, is that think of it as a network addressable process. I really like that. And ACA is very much in line with that. You know, a, a node in an ACA cluster is a network addressable process, basically. So ACA works just fine in Docker containers and it works just fine in environments like Kubernetes. The, the only real challenge, and this is fairly minor, is that when the cluster is bootstrapped, there's this concept of seed nodes. And since everything's dynamic here, um, what are the seed nodes need to be managed by some level of intelligence. So there's well-defined ways of handling that. But once you've solved that problem of what are my seed nodes in a NACA cluster, it works great in a, any kind of a, a network addressable process environment, which is you know, Docker with Kubernetes, for example. Um, and uh, again, the um, nodes can come and go. As long as they know, uh, as when it, the big thing here is when a node joins the cluster, it needs to be able to phone home. It needs at least a list of, say, one or more nodes to say, hey, I'm joining the cluster. You know, it's got to talk to somebody to join the cluster. So when a node joins, that's when you feed in the seed nodes. It's like, uh, Oliver, you're the seed node. So when I join, I need to know your network address so I can send you a message and say, hey, Oliver, I want to join the, 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 the party, right? And then you let everybody else in the party, okay, Hugh's here. So, and then the party kind of starts communicating with me because now they know who I am. So it's the management of that, of those seed nodes is the, is the main thing that has to occur. But other than that, I think we're, or, you know, this is commonly being done. And it's just, it's kind of becoming the new landscape of, for doing things with containers in some, some kind of orchestrated environment like Kubernetes. Great, thanks for answering that one, Hugh. Um, we, we have, we've uh, talked in the past about uh, circuit breakers, and it was uh, kind of new for me to realize that circuit breakers are actually a preventative measure rather than a, uh, something to make your, your system work better. Um, so one of our audience members asks, uh, how does the, do we use circuit breakers with Akka? And if not, what, what does Akka do to prevent the need for a circuit breaker, let's say? Yeah, oh, de definitely. Um, yeah, circuit breakers are there, and they they serve a very useful purpose in Akka. Um, the main thing being that remember that the timeout that I was talking about, um, where you send a message to an actor, but that actor can't respond. And maybe there's a situation where you're sending a message to an actor, and that actor can't respond because it it's trying to talk to a database, but the database is down. So the actor is still alive, but the it's unable to perform what it's supposed to perform because the database is down. So in that case, this is where a circuit breaker could come into play, where instead of waiting, say, for the database to come back, which could be slow because the database is you know, down or waiting for some kind of timeout at the, at the database API level or, or whatever, that actor can know that the database is down. So any messages coming into it essentially are immediately thrown back saying, hey, I can't do what you asked me to do because I'm broken. So that's a circuit breaker. Right, so right away you're taking pressure off the database because you're not hammering with the, the database with all kinds of requests. The other thing, you're not building a backlog of messages in the message queue for actors because those actors, instead of slowly working through message by message by message because it can't do what it's supposed to do and it's running into timeouts, things like that, you're trying to talk to the database. It Once it sees that there's a problem with database, the circuit breaker pops, and it just starts rejecting messages right away. Boom, real fast, you know, real fast. The message comes in, sorry, can't do it, sorry, can't do it. So there's no backlog that's building up. So it pulls a, a ton of pressure off of things happening within ACA itself when these circuit breakers pop. And then the circuit breaker has these strategies for periodically checking and backing off, you know, trying to see, okay, when the database connection recovers, it'll start less letting messages flow through. So every once in a while, it'll let one message through to see if it works. If it doesn't work, the circuit breaker remains popped. But when it does work, it goes, oh, okay, cool. The database is, is up again. Let's let the, the, the flow go back through. So yeah, circuit breakers are, are there and, and certainly very important in situations like the one I just described. All right, uh, we are running uh, quite low on time, but there were a lot of questions about uh, cluster sharding. I think that this is an area where uh, 
a lot of uh, a lot of additional guidance and description is useful. Um, so, what actually happens to an Akka mailbox during when it when it's sharded? There's nothing sp special when it's sharded. You know, each actor uh, you know, in the shard, <clears throat> and all the actors are in a shard somewhere, and messages are finding you know getting routed to those actors, and that actor has a, a mailbox. Maybe the question is also sitting around what happens if that the node goes down, then there were, there are messages in that mailbox when the node goes down. There, the, the messages are lost. Um, and actually, I'm working on a, a log series. I wrote part one, I'm, and I'm working on part two right now, and in part three, all about messaging. And the messaging is things like um, at most once, which I kind of call maybe once, sending a message. Uh, at least once, meaning that the message could be sent at least once, but it could be sent multiple times, and exactly once. So these, this blog series that I'm working on, the first one was the, the maybe once or at most once, kind of talking about that. The second one's going to be the at least once, and the third one's going to be um, exactly once. And, um, but to back to the question, the if um, there's no guarantee that messages to actors get sent, it's um, at most once or maybe once. I, I like maybe once more. It makes sense to me because uh, mm -hmm. you might not get the message. You got to deal with that. That that's a, a feature. All right. And our final question uh, re relates to uh, clusters in production. And what are some strategies for increasing or decreasing the amount of nodes in, in your ACA cluster uh, and doing that seamlessly and efficiently? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> so, well, there's two, I, can, I think there's kind of two levels of dynamics here. One is that um, is your system designed to handle the changes in the topology of the cluster? You know, can your system, the way you've designed it, and it's not just the responsibility of ACA, but you have a, you know, a responsibility as well. It's not super complicated. It's just something you have to take into consideration. Can you handle nodes leaving or joining the cluster? And the, the other part is when should nodes leave or join the cluster? You know, so in one case, you don't have a choice. A node goes down. You didn't want it to go down, but it went down. You got to deal with it. Um, if you solve that problem, all of a sudden, what Kind of blew my mind was we solved the problem of maybe we want to scale back like we, in one situation we were doing rolling updates we didn't want to shut the system down we had built the system so that it could tolerate losing a node when we didn't want it to but now we got for free losing a node when we did want it to so we would shut down a node we would update it bring it back into the cluster and we'd kind of do a rolling update we just roll through each node in the cluster um, and bring it up so my point is that if you're solving the problem for resiliency and losing nodes, you're starting to resolve the problem for um, losing nodes when you want to shrink capacity. And you're also solving the problem in many cases for gaining nodes when you want to increase capacity because your system, like cluster sharding can handle this, and you can certainly do things similar to the way cluster sharding works on your own to have actors migrate over to new nodes as they join the cluster. This is the part that's the most fun, I think, in Aka is to do these kinds of things. Well, Hugh, I've uh, I've said it publicly, but I have to say that this is the most comprehensive uh, overview to Aka I've I've ever seen. And uh, congratulations on making such an excellent deck. The feedback from our audience is is tremendous. Um, we do have a lot of questions that we weren't able to get around to, folks, uh, and apologies for that. However, if you are a Lightbent subscriber, you can always ask all of your what ifs, how tos, and technical questions to our uh, support team through our customer portal. And these emails go directly to our to the engineers. So uh, Conrad Malowski, uh, Patrick Nordwall, the, the team lead of ACA. Um, it goes to our Logum and Play framework and Scala engineers. So this is this is one of those nice things that you can do. Uh, not just break, fix, and bug reports. So you can always go to, to our customer portal. And if you're not a customer, you should maybe become one if you've got a lot of interesting questions. Also, you can email me directly at oliver at lightben.com, and I'll do my best to connect you with the right people if you have any further questions about 
uh, reactive platform, Akka's commercial modules, which I've added some links to in the chat. And uh, to keep up with Hugh, you can follow him on Twitter at McKeeH3, as well as visit his ongoing uh, blog journey on developer.lightbend.com, which is our tech hub, where you can also find guides, blogs, and other materials to get you going. So thanks to everyone for joining us today. Hugh, again, thanks for literally wading through the storm in order to, uh, to, get, to get to us today. And uh, have a wonderful day, everybody. Talk to you soon. Thanks, guys.